have you here in person and also on Zoom. Um, it's a pleasure to have everyone tonight. Let's pray and open up, and then we'll begin our program. Father, we thank you for your blessing. And we, again, just thank you so very much for this Sabbath day. We thank you for everyone here, everyone that will be participating in this program. We ask for your blessing. And we ask, dear Lord, that we may leave with new knowledge and understanding and that we may go forth and spread those um, knowledge that we um, um, gain today. Bless those who are on their way. And we ask for your protection while we're here and your journey's mercies as we leave today. We give thanks and praise that you may bless each panelist, oh God, and interviewer, oh God, and we just ask, dear God, that you bless us all. We give praise always in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Our scripture reading, we don't want to spend too long on this a preliminary because we do have a group of panelists that will be um, helping us out today. Um, so our scripture reading will be read, um, Exodus 4, verse 2, by Brother J. Johns. Amen. Good afternoon. So the, so the Lord said to him, What is that you in your hand? He said, A rod. May the Lord, Lord of God be blessed. All right. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Jay, for that reading. All right, at this time, we're going to go right into our AY creeds. That will be our pledge, or we're going to start out with our, our mission, and we're going to read together. Those online, if you can see it, please read. Muted, thank you. Um, so together here, we'll read that. Our mission is the salvation, the salvation of the youth through Jesus Christ. Christ. We, we understand youth ministry to be that work of the church that is conducted for with and by young people. Thank you. And the aim, the Advent message to all the world in my generation. And the AY motto is the love of Christ compels me. And the AY pledges loving the Lord Jesus. I promise to take an active part in the youth ministry of the church doing what I can to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. And then we're gonna do our AY song together. So please stand for our AY song, those at home on Zoom. If you know it, please sing along, mute it, please. Thank you. Adventist youth are we from every land and sea. Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth, Adventist youth. I wanna sing that one more time. Start over for me, brother. Adventist youth are we from every land and sea. Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth, Adventist youth. Praise God, you may be seated. Thank you. Okay, our topic, our topic for today is what is in your hand? As Brother Jay read, what is in your hand? And God is asking each and every one of us, those online and here in person, what is in your hand? The objective of the program this afternoon is to help prepare our young people as they consider their career choices. Um, it is geared towards helping them understand how their profession slash jobs um, can be used as a ministry opportunity. It is in an opportunity for our panelists to share how our youth can maintain their faith no matter, no matter where they're serving. And so we'll have a list of panelists that will be coming up soon. And those, we will have the list of panelists online as well on Zoom. Um, we want to make, to, for you to understand that, you know, we're a blessed church. Um, we have diverse gifts, talents, callings, and skills, um, and areas of ex expertise that we um, thank God for. We do not elevate or rank any profession above the other. And so, we want you to know that the panelists that we've selected here in person and online 
were selected based on the perceived challenges that one would face to maintain his or her faith in such an area where they work. Okay, so none is we're not putting one above. Oh, I must be that or I must be. No, we just want you to know that with their faith in God, they are able to, um, again, overcome challenges, even in the workplace. Um, at this time, Dorothea, uh, Sister Dorothea will um, give us a hymn of reflection from hymn number 359. Whenever you're ready, Sister Dorothea, we're ready. That's Sister Dorcas, um, Sister Rain. Oh, why did I say Dorothea? Sister Dorcas, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Sister. Sister um, Darkest, I can see that you're online and you're muted. Um, I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, our hymn is 359. Hark the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and wait today? Fields are wide, the harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away? Oh, the Lord and long the master calleth. Rich reward he offers free. Who will answer gladly, saying, Here I am, O oh Lord, send me. Um, okay. Okay, um, if you cannot cross the ocean and the heathen lands explore, you can find the heaven nearer. You can help them at your door. If you can not speak like angels, if you can not preach like Paul, do you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. If you cannot be the old man standing high on Zion's wall, pointing out the path to heaven, offering life and peace to all, with your prayers and, and your bounties, you can do what have demand. You can be like faithful Aaron, holding up the prophet's hand. While the souls of men are dying, and the master calls for you, let none hear you idly saying, there's nothing that I can do. Glad Gladly take the task he gives you. Let his work your pleasure be. Answer quickly when he calls. Here I am, O Lord, send me. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sister Darkest. Okay, I'm going to call the panelists um, forward. Um, in person, we do have today Sister Josephine Joseph, Man. and she is a social worker that specializes in homeless, mental health disorder, and family issues. Sister Josephine, you can take a seat. Yeah. In person, we also have Brother, I mean, Elder Orrin Crawford, the dietitian working with the dialysis patient. You can take your seat, please. And then our last person in person would be Elder Ray Daniel, a criminal lawyer. All right, please take your seat here. <laughs> and then online, who will be joining us, our panelists online, will be Elder Alan David. And he is a chemical engineer professor at Auburn University, and he'll be joining us online. Just give us a wave. All right. And then we also have Elder Benson Akingbemi, um, Professor of Anatomy, College of Veterinarian Medicine at Auburn University. Please give us a wave, sir. 
All right, thank you. Online, we also have um, Elder Laurie Daniel, former chief executive officer of several Fortune 500 companies and is currently the CEO of the Next Level Coaching and um, Consultant. And Sister Laurie, I, I did, oh, I see, give us a wave, please. All right, thank you. And I don't, not sure if Brother um, Quinton will be on today, um, but he is the military. If he does join us, I don't think I see him. I mean, this time we'll have our host for the second portion of this um, program, which should be um, Sister Raven Roberts. <clears throat> All right, um, let's start off with a quick prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together and have our youth program. Um, Lord, I ask that you would orchestrate and inspire this, um, this presentation that we are having and show us and other youths how they can be used in their career choices to glorify your name and to um, bring others closer to Jesus and your precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I would like to start off by asking each one of you guys to, um, I know that um, Sister Rain did introduce you in your career field or profession, but we would also like to know why you chose the career that you chose. Um, how about let's start with Elder Ray. Well, um, I'm an assistant district attorney for the Chattahoochee Judicial Circuit that covers Columbus um, um, and the surroundings, Marion, Talbot, Taylor, um, and the, uh, um, Chattahoochee. And there's one more county in um, North that we cover as well. So, I mean, I've practiced as a district attorney all my career, pretty much. I think this is year number 34. So, oh, <laughs> so um, um, I enjoy it. Why did I, how did I get started in it? I just, I studied um, law. And when I graduated from law school, I um, had a um, pension for doing trials. And then I um, was hired on and I really enjoy it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, Elder Crawford. All right. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I am Orrin Crawford, and I am a registered dietitian and uh, do work in dialysis. Um, now, how did I get started as a registered dietitian, or why did I choose a um, uh, uh, dietitian? Well, uh, it started in high school. Um, I, I read the book, Councils on Diets, Foods and Diet. And that I, I was very intrigued with um with that book and the 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 messages that I got from that book, and and that led me in the pathway of um you know I doing something in the health field, um particularly in nutrition. So when I got to college, my major was um uh, nutrition dietetics. <laughs> um, so I I just uh, continue in that field because I felt that there is a special connection between between nutrition. And, um, and health. And I saw how, you know, just using nutritional principle, principles, we can, um, you know, preserve our health. And, um, and that was, uh, I guess, fascinating. And I, and I just went from there. Hello? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for that question, Ms. Raven. Uh, how did I get into the field of social work? Um, as you all know, I come from Sudan. And when I was young, I had interest in people. I just love to help. And I thought, wow, what way could I help someone? And because I saw that uh, back home, we, uh, the, we needed a lot of help. So from even when I was young, I wanted to get into a field where I can be of support to people. And so I ended up going to Asia and I started social work. And my initial uh, idea was to return back to Sudan so that I can make an impact. Mm -hmm. However, 
I was not able to go because of the situation that was happening in Sudan for a long time, for those of you who might not know. So I ended up in America, but I still have that desire to work with the people. And so it wasn't after all uh, a place where, you know, I could lend my support only in Africa. When I came here to America, I worked uh, for the state uh, with the children with the behavioral problems. So I worked actually in Muskogee County in the school, you know, the, uh, working with the children, uh, little kids in the different schools and uh, just to, to support the, the, the families and, and, and help in the schools and to make a change, to bring change to these kids. So after a while, then I started working with um, uh, the state again, but with uh, adults with mental health. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, I still desire, my, de my desire is to, if everything goes well, I really want to go back home and, and help my people. But I think that even right now, I believe that I, I am helping other people. So I, that's how I got into the field of uh, social work. Just working with the people is something that is rewarding. Thank you so much for that, Sister Josephine. Um, I would like to also ask, um, yeah. Um, Brother Elder Alan David, um, how it is that you chose the profession that you have today? Okay, hey, thank you. Um, and good afternoon and happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I'll give you the short answer. You know, my, my, my journey has been quite uh, convoluted and, and taken many different paths. You know, as has been said before, I'm a chemical engineer. I do research in the biomedical field. Um, and then I'm a faculty here at Auburn University. So I'll talk about how I chose to become a faculty. Um, you know, I, I think at a very, very young age, you know, uh, realized that I enjoyed teaching. Uh, I have a younger brother and sister uh, and I enjoyed helping them out. I have younger cousins. Uh, so at, at a very young age, I, I realized that I really enjoyed, you know, sharing what I had learned with others. Um, but, you know, I, 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 could, I would have never imagined that, that I would be a faculty member, you know, even as a undergraduate in, at the university, it just seemed something that was beyond me. Um, but at one point I, I had this opportunity to um, apply for faculty positions. Um, and I was encouraged by, uh, you know, some uh, very good mentors. Um, and, and so when I had the opportunity to accept the position here at Auburn University, I, I, I was excited and jumped at it. And, you know, there, there are many reasons I was excited about it, but I would say the, the most, um, uh, kind of the, the foremost goal I had was to become a better instructor. Um, so, so I would say, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I chose the career path I'm in now. Thank you for sharing. Um, and also Elder Benson at King B Bimi, um, why you chose um, the career that you have also. Uh, um, thank you, uh, my sister. Uh, happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I can give you a little uh, background to my journey currently uh, at um, since I don't know, I introduced us earlier, I am a professor of anatomy in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at Auburn, Auburn University. Um, however, it took me a while to um, get to become a lecturer or to a faculty because um, I was raised by my grandparents and uh, that's in Africa. I'm from West Africa. And so we used to go to farm a lot. Um, we were happy when we have to go to school, so we don't go to a farm on a daily basis. But over the weekends and on holidays, I would go with my grandmom and my grandpa uh, to farm. And this is what they do, really. Uh, subsistence farming in Africa is what you do. You 
you produce some food from which you eat, and then you sell the other, and that's how uh, we, uh, they were having their, their um, livelihood. So going to farm with my grandparents, I loved the farms. Um, but over time, I realized um, I did not quite like the cropping part of the farm, you know, cutting trees and planting stuff. I became more interested in livestock. Mm -hmm. Now, in that part of Africa, it's mostly cattle and small ruminants, you know, goats and sheep. So I used to dream, or I had the dream that when I grow up, I would like to have a farm of my own, you know, tend to these animals and raise them and be happy just looking at them. So when I left home uh, after high school to go to college, I decided to do a veterinary medicine. So I, uh, I spent maybe five, six years to, in college to um, uh, attend my doctor of veterinary medicine degree with the hope that that would be uh, a, a helpful, the skills I acquired from that training will be helpful for me uh, when I eventually uh, have my own farm. But while in college, I came to like the lecturers, you know, uh, my, I'm from Nigeria and Nigeria was still very good in those days when I was growing up. The lecturers and professors were well taken care of, not necessarily rich, but you know, everything was dandy. You know, they had their offices, they had their own individual staff. So I said, yeah, I think I would like to have this kind of a life. Maybe I can become um, um, a lecturer and then become a professor. So I started now thinking of, okay, I'm gonna get my DVM and after that, I would train further to become a lecturer. So that, that's what I did. So after I got the DVM, I went back to school, got my master's, then I got my PhD and I started teaching. Uh, I taught for a while in, uh, in Nigeria before uh, I started with my family. My wife is just behind me here. You can see her, I believe. Um, so we, um, we, we left Nigeria for a period. We went to Zimbabwe. Uh, so I was a teacher in Zimbabwe for some time. And uh, then came back, came to the United States where I was lucky enough to also, um, after some training too, uh, got a job as, um, as an assistant professor uh, at Auburn and then later you know, rise, rose to the ranks to become a, a professor of anatomy. So that was my, uh, my little journey. Thank you so much for sharing, Elder Benson. Um, and also, Elder Lurie, um, how did you choose your profession? Hello, and happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good to see my church family via video. Um, you know, I have always had, as long as I can remember, an interest in uh, human behavior and understanding sort of why we do what we do. And at the same time, I was raised in an environment of business men and women. My mom um, was a business person. My dad owned several grocery stores. They owned African import stores. And I was fortunate enough to find a major in college that combined psychology as well as business. And so by training, I'm a master's level organizational psychologist. And with that, I didn't know exactly when I graduated where I wanted to go. But I would say that I kind of, my, my actual job in the insurance industry sort of found me. But it, it found me doing what I love to do, and that is helping people and helping businesses become better. And so that's a short story of how I got into that profession. Amen. Okay. And also, um, what type, what kind of people do you guys encounter on a daily basis? And what desire, um, what good do you desire for the people that you encounter? Um, let's go ahead and start off with um, Elder Alan David. Hey, thank you. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, being a, a university professor, there, there are many different groups of individuals we interact with. Um, you know, the, the, the obvious would be the, uh, our undergraduate students. So, so we have, you know, students ranging from 
the freshmen to, to graduating seniors. Um, I deal with graduate students because we do have a research component. We deal with other faculty and administrators and collaborators at other institutes. We deal, deal with people at uh, different agencies that we get funding from. So, so I would say we, um, we encounter and interact with a broad cross-section of individuals, um, you know, uh, both in terms of age, uh, you know, profession, um, and, and, and so it, it uh, I, you know, it, it's a very diverse uh, interaction that we have. Um, what desire, good do I desire for them? Um, you know, my, my goal is to, uh, through all my interactions, uh, is to be a positive influence on, on other people. Um, you know, I, I try to um, make sure that, um, you know, I'm, I'm helping others, whether it's, you know, our, our undergraduate students and, and just learning the content of the course. You know, I, I teach chemical engineering. Um, and, and, and so some of the more uh, difficult uh, courses, um, you know, in, in the curriculum. Um, and, and so just, you know, um, uh, trying to convey to the students that, you know, uh, although we, we, they struggle through the course, we, we essentially tortured them uh, by, by the course content. Uh, but, but you know, just getting across that it's for their good, you know, that, that this is an investment in their future and they, you know, life has a way of, um, you know, balancing things out and you get out of life often what you put in. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just encouraging them to, to uh, do their very best um, even when, even when the results don't, uh, don't seem obvious at, 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 uh, at the moment, you know, often we work hard and, and it seems like we're getting nowhere, but, but sometimes you have to work hard for some time before you have built up the foundation to advance. Um, so, so I, I would say, you know, I, I, could, I could go on, but, but I'll, I'll let the other panel speak. Amen. Uh, what you said, it reminded me a lot of the Christian experience, like how we have to persevere through, even though we may not see the results of what we're doing at the moment, but just seeing the end goal, like we have to work toward what the end objective is. Um, I would like to hear from Elder Lurie. What, um, what kind of people do you daily encounter and what is the good that you desire of them? Okay, so, so now I, I talked a little bit about being in the insurance industry and now I am an entrepreneur of my own company of consulting and coaching. And I would say in both of those industries, my own businesses as well as the insurance industry, I encountered people that had problems that needed to be solved. And that is very broad. The problems were very different, but in some, they had problems that they needed resolutions for. And my role was to help facilitate those resolutions. And the good that I desired for them, um, one is to understand that often they have the knowledge within themselves to solve the problem. And also, in, I have the opportunity in both those areas to um, actually pray with people, even in the uh, Fortune 200 companies that I've had. And so there were times that at, I would need to uh, take the opportunity to even direct them in the business world to seek Jesus for some answers to their problems. And so I would say that has been the... Um, the consistent thread through both of my career paths. Amen. And um, Elder Benson uh, King Bimmy, um, I would like to also ask you the same question. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, dear sister. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, being a teacher, lecturer, professor. You know, we deal with students all the time. And I really, and I tell my wife this, this is one of the best things I could do in my life because every year we get to see new people. So I said, I can't imagine working in a place where I see the same people all my career. <laughs> I wouldn't enjoy that. So um, being a teacher gives me great joy because I am so excited 
right now we are preparing for um, students to come in in August and we are meetings and I say, oh yeah, you see, I'm excited because we're going to have a new, a new group of students that we're going to have to uh, nurture. So that's one thing that um, really um, is great about um, being a teacher. Um, in terms of the way we, the way we want to see them, it's both ways. Um, I will follow forward say, what have I gained or what insights have I gained from a teaching students from year to year? Because of the age, as what um, Alan said, you know, they're young people. So when they come and you see how much pressure they, they, they are subjected to, I see all kinds of um, strategies by these students. And I learn a lot from that, you know. You actually then, you can discern differences between people, even at that age, how each one is reacting, adjusting, and, and, and trying to get along and survive in a very, very tight program, which, which uh, my area of uh, veterinary medicine training is about. So that, I benefit from that. We have three kids of our own, and so, um, I just sometimes just replicate that the way I studied my kids. And so that, that's a very positive thing. What do I desire for them? One of the things that I, um, in, my, in our area of training is that we have to organize, it's mostly a practical training. We have to organize our students into groups of four in the lab. And we are in the lab most of the time. And so one of the things we tell them when they come in is we want you to be a team player because you're going to be stuck with this. Every member in your group, the other three members in your group, you're going to be stuck with them for the rest of the semester. So the earlier you get to know each other, the earlier you can work together harmoniously, the better for all of you. And we are watching you. We are in the lab. It's an open space. We can give you your stuff to do and we are watching the way you do it. And one thing I have deliberately done really was as a director of the course, when I became director, I made sure I declined all, all applications to me for anyone to change their group. I wanted them to get used to, even if you have a difficult somebody in your group, I told them you got to find a way to make it work. It's not permanent. You just have to work through 16 weeks. So. Um, I said, I'm not going to change anybody because before then we will allow if you don't like your group or the people are feuding a little bit, we say, okay, we can change the group. So since I became director of the course, I have, I have not done that. And I tell them, I just want you to find a way to get along. So that's one thing I desire in young people because you don't know where you're going to find yourself. I just mentioned to you earlier on. We've been all over the whole place, even in our country. We traveled to the Northern part. We went to Southern Africa. Before we came here, we were in New York City. Then we landed in Alabama, which is even so much contrasting to New York City. So uh, for young people, I really like for them to be able to adjust as much as they can to whatever situation they have, especially when you know it's not going to be a permanent thing. Um, so that was, that has, those have been my insights. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And um, Elder Ray, also, what kind of people do you encounter and what good do you desire for them? Well, um, um, I really encounter people at the most um, tragic part of their lives. I'm, like I said, I'm a, a statistic district attorney and I work primarily, my job has been in the major crimes division and I handle um, um, murders and child molestations and um, all of the most serious crimes there are. And it's a bad situation for those people who are the victims and who are the um, defendants. I take a case from the police after they investigate it and I research it and look at it and see how I could best use that evidence to motivate 12 people who I've never met um, to um, uh, convict the person if he's guilty. If he's not guilty, I'll make that decision and a bit beforehand and I'm not holding him responsible for the charges. But um, I'm hoping that I give the folks involved a sense of justice and peace that it's been properly taken care of, that um, justice has amounted, they've done the right thing and um, either their son or their daughter or their mother, their father has um, 
a sense that it was done right and professionally. So I hope to um, to find to have that piece um, given to those folks who are participants in the trial process. I also handle the appeals process for my cases, and that means I go before um, Court of Appeals justices as well as Supreme Court justices. And I've done this in Nebraska and Wisconsin and um, Georgia, where I try to influence them that the process that we did, we tried the case and the conviction was fair. It was done well and in accordance with the law. So I try to make sure that that's, um, that I impress upon them that um, um, the job was done well. So I think that's, I try to do those things and um, that's what I do. Thank you so much for sharing. And Elder Oren. Uh, yes, so as a renal dietitian, I also encountered encounter patients um, who are at a very, uh, I guess, low point in their life um, health-wise. Uh, these are patients that are on in, that are in end stage renal disease, uh, so their kidney is no longer functional. Um, so when they come to dialysis, um, this is kind of like the, um, you know, the kind of like the end of the road, really, as it relates to their kidney. And you know, if they don't get dialysis, um, their 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 toxin is going to build up in their body, and they're going to die. Um, uh, and, and so uh, my role as a, as a dietitian is to um, help them to help them to understand that um, diet also plays a, a, a critical role in their in the preservation of their life um, because you know what they eat is going to add um, toxicity to their body um, and in between treatment if that if that toxin developed to a critical level, they could actually die. Like for example, if they're taking in uh, too much potassium, right? That can create a cardiac um, arrest and patients have um, been admitted to the hospital because they have um, overindulged in let's say orange juice or um, to bananas or tomatoes or um, whatever is uh, high in potassium. So, you know, my, my job is really to, to guide them along the process and to help them to understand that this is a, um, a critical point. Um, and so in terms of the, the type, uh, uh, the cross section of patients that I, uh, that I encounter, um, you know, I, I, a wide selection, but predominantly in this area, it's um, African-American um, and, and, and you know, hypertension and diabetes, those are two um, main risk factors for being on end-stage renal disease. So, and, and, and we understand that those, are, those two things are very pre prevalent in um, African-American population. Um, so uh, I would say about 90%, 85% of um, the clinic population is, um, is African-American. Um, then, then you have, uh, you know, Caucasian, Hispanics, um, Asian too. Um, so, so, so I'm dealing, you know, with tho those, um, those individuals and, um, in terms of the age, uh, the age, um, you know, we have had patients who are, you know, uh, 16, 17, all the way to patients, um, who are 80 in their eighties and, um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and in terms of um, their being on dialysis, uh, you know, they, they can be on dialysis. Some, we've had patients who, who are on dialysis for 20 years. Um, and, and then, you know, some, some people are, you know, they, they on, on five or, you know, within a few years after they're diagnosed, they die two years. So anywhere from, you know, maybe two, three years to 20 years. They're on dialysis, and of course, during that time, they can receive a, a transplant, um, and that transplant gives them an opportunity to live a somewhat normal life. They still have to take medi medications, um, and, and and so, uh, in terms of um, these uh, these individuals, uh, you know, um, what do I desire for for them? Um, foremost, uh, as the Bible say, you know, I wish that they were 
that they would prosper in health, um, you know, as they're so prosperous. And that's um, two uh, tenant that I, I try to um, I try to encourage in each encounter, right? The the physical and the spiritual. Um, so you know, as I give them diet education, or I help them with binders or vitamin D, um, and, and you know, Sensapar and those medicines that are uh, somewhat diet related. Um, I'm, I'm I'm also encouraging them to to look to the one who's um, able to give them spiritual help. Um, so, you know, and so sometimes I'll pay, pray with my patients, um, you know, just depending on where they are spiritually. Um, I'll pray with them and encourage them and let them understand that um, we serve a mighty God, a powerful God, who is able to take them through every situation that they have and that they will encounter. Um, and that is a, a source of encouragement um, for them too. So, uh, you know, I just uh, continue, I, I just, uh, you know, just continue to encourage them in the Lord and um, yeah. as I do the, the diet education. Amen. <clears throat> and Sister Josephine also. Okay, so in my everyday work, I encounter people uh, in which the challenges of life have thrown them off balance. And so they see no way out. Mentally, they feel like they have come to the end of their rope and they are ready to take their life because they, they just can't see the, any, any other way out. So um, my job is to talk through the, to, to them through the difficulties of life, hoping that they will come back on track so that they can um, start life over again. And it really doesn't matter who it is, but it's from the highest to, to the lowest ladder that it, you know, mental health does not segregate people. So my job is to, to talk to them and, and, uh, and, and, and offer them solutions as to how they can deal with the life's problem. But at, at the same time, there are situations where you, they are, you can even talk to them. So they needed a little bit, uh, a little advanced um, care. And in this case, what we do is uh, send them to either to the hospital or send them to Atlanta where they can mentally be stabilized before they can come back and, and get, get on track. So that is what, what I do. And um, when they start to get on track, it's, it's very rewarding. And uh, like Brother Oren say, as a Christian, sometimes they are receptive. And when you, you offer the other way out, you know, God, the author of everything is able. I think people need to realize that apart from the things that we have on this planet Earth, we need God. And some are receptive. And when you see someone uh, in a critical situation, uh, realizing that there is more to life than me taking my life is it, very rewarding. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sister Josephine. Um, <clears throat> also, um, have you ever found that your career conflicted with your Christian beliefs? And if so, did you feel that God did not want you there? in that career that maybe you should have chose something else or maybe you know did you feel confused about where you were at that time um i would like to start with elder ray oh, really? yeah. <laughs> you know um my career is filled with a lot of 
controversy. <laughs> and I get to delve into people's lives mm -hmm. as to what went on during the most tragic times of their lives, um, where there's a death in the family or there's child molestation or, I mean, it's, it's horrible. Um, those facts and circumstances um, coming to light just um, em empowers me to understand that God is the real truth and valid part of my life. And I can't take it for granted. Otherwise, I would be inundated with this, um, the, the ways of this world. So, uh, you know, I, um, I take it very seriously that I'm a Christian. And when I try to mm -hmm. give my closing arguments and my arguments to the court and to the, the, um, the jury, I find that the most compelling arguments are those with the Christian values that I, I love and that I live by and that, that gives me life and health and it gives the jury a sense of stability on their decision. So whether it not has caused me to change it, I don't think so. I think that I've been challenged to follow God's word and to bring that, and not necessarily saying it from the Bible, but telling people those same values that I find so important as a Christian. And um, I, I think it's bode me well, and it's bode, and it gives juries, people I'd never met in my life, an opportunity to be strong and courageous and do the right thing where they otherwise would not. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, Elder Oren? Yes, uh, this is a good question. <laughs> um, you know, we, we have heard the term that says, uh, the, you know, health is the right hand of the gospel, right? Um, the work of um, taking care of the health. Um, and so how could you possibly come in, con in, in conflict, right? Doing the work of, um, the, the work of healthcare uh, and um, this one might be a little controversial for some people, but for me, um, there was a point in, in my life when I was working at a hospital, and uh, that hospital um, had me scheduled for um, weekend duties, um, uh, which included working on um, the Sabbath. Now, uh, I, you know, for me personally, I wanted to be with my family uh, in church on the Sabbath, um, worshiping God, and and I and I felt it was a distraction to my my uh, well to me to be in the hospital setting. Um, so I I spoke with my supervisor, and my supervisor, uh, you know, she said no, <laughs> um, you you know you cannot get Sabbath off, and you um, you must work on Sabbath, and um, and that was the end of the story for her as far as she's concerned um and um so i, I uh took it to the lord in prayer <laughs> and uh I, we serve a mighty god and uh you know spoke with my wife and actually my wife um uh, unbeknownst to me started looking for another job for me <laughs> so so um she um saw this one position um in dialysis uh which doesn't well she didn't know that it didn't include weekend but um you know i looked into it applied uh got an interview um and i mean typically this this you know interviews uh you know last maybe 15 minutes or so but this uh interview lasted like almost like an hour <laughs> Um, the, my boss, she just, um, kept on talking and talking and, 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 um, and, and so eventually to make a long story short, you know, I was offered the position and, uh, you know, come to find out that this was a Monday to Friday position weekends would be off. And that was such a blessing. Not only did I get the weekend off, but when I, when, when she started talking about the salary, um, I mean, the salary, the position was like, I was like, wow, it, it was, uh, um, let me see, doing the calculation was at least 30% more, uh, a 30% increase Amen. pay raise Amen. not to work on the Sabbath. So, so we, we, we serve a mighty God. Um, and whatever conflict we, 
we, you know, we go through God is there and he hears our prayers. And, um, and that was the resolution of that issue, um, that conflict. And, and God really work, worked in that situation. Amen. Now, I do have a question for you, Elder Oren, um, because you are in the medical field. Yes. And you know that many of us, you know, Adventists that are in the medical field and um, they may hold certain positions that may really require for them, you know, like if they work in the ER or um, even in the pharmacy, you know, in the hospital where people need access to medication, whatever it is, uh, what is your, how do you remedy that? What is your idea on that? <laughs> right. Um, so, and I started to out saying that this was, you know, this might be a controversial topic because, you know, the Bible does say that, um, you know, to do good on the Sabbath, that it, that is a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, the work of uh, the, 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 ministry, the ministry of um, health, right, that, that is a, a ministry. Um, so to that, I, I believe that um, working in the health field to taking taking care of um, the sick, and bring in, um, you know, health and relief to individuals on the Sabbath. I, I think that is in, in line with um, the Gospel Commission. Um, however, for me personally, um, in my role in, in the health field, I felt like I needed to um, be with my family on the Sabbath, worshiping, um, and I was not convicted to be in the hospital on the Sabbath. Um, so we um, took it to the Lord in prayer and God answered. Amen. So, so, so it's, uh, I think it's an individual decision and, um, and individuals have that right to make the choice. Yes, I agree. I would just say that, yes, we should um, take it to the Lord in prayer and also remember that, I mean, if you do work in, and not, it's not only in healthcare, but also in, um, in, you know, criminal justice field, you know, sometimes police officers have to work, firefighters may have to work, um, there are certain positions, but um, I would just say that, um, yes, definitely take it to the Lord in prayer. It is not wrong to do good on the Sabbath, but now um, I would say that you definitely want to pray about what you do with the um, the financial gain that you receive on that day, because you, you can choose what you want to do with the, with the financial gain. So, yes. Um, Sister Josephine, um, have you ever felt in conflict with God about your career, um, with your Christian beliefs? And um, also, if so, did you feel that God wanted you to move or she, that you should not have been there? How would you answer that question? <laughs> I'll answer that. Um, in short, I think uh, there was uh, one at one point that I was almost going to work on Sabbath, but it didn't go through. I think the Lord intervened but <laughs> before, before that. And I think he knew, probably he knew, I don't know, but God knows everything, but that didn't happen. And I was so thankful. I, I just praised him for that. But um, the, when I worked with the children with the behavioral pro problems, if they had any issue, I was there for them. That means not only Sabbath or any time uh, at a time when I am off the clock. And if they needed me, I was there because I felt it wasn't just work, but I am making a difference in this child's life and in the family's life. But um, I'm thankful to say that um, our office. Uh, operates Monday through Friday, yes, and Lord. so I am off on 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 the weekend, and I I thank God for that. And also, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I love to work with people, and uh, I interact with people. I hear people's problems. I talk, to, I listen, and I, if there is any solution to, to what they are, they are encountering, 
I offer that. And so it has never been a problem that I have had any conflict that this is not the right way I should have gone. So I'm, I'm happy. I thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Um, Elder Alan David, have you ever felt in conflict? Uh, so uh, being a, a professor at a public institute, um, uh, so, so there are uh, often conflicts and, and you know, as others have talked about, uh, often you know, for me the conflict has come with uh, regards to Sabbath. Um, you know, and, and, and so I'll, I'll share one example, um, you know, uh, so, so I work with graduate students and, and so I mentor graduate students for uh, some of them four or five years, um, you know, work with them closely. And then at the end of the graduation, you know, once they've earned their PhD, then typically the advisor would put the student at the graduation ceremony, where all our ceremonies are on Sabbaths. Um, so, so for me, that, that was a, yeah, and you know, I, I could justify that, you know what, this is not for myself. I'm doing it, this for my students and uh, it's not for myself. Um, but I decided early on, you know, the, the problem was, you know, if, if I did that, then, uh, you know, my, my other colleagues would also start to ask me to do other things. And so very early on, I said, you know what, and, and I, I'm upfront for my students. I say, you know what, I, I'm, uh, you know, would love to be there to, to honor you and, and, and be a part of this uh, celebration. But for these reasons, I can't be there. And, and you know, I, I hope you understand. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, again, I tell both my students and colleagues that if there was an emergency, I'll, I'd be there. You know, if something happens in the lab, you know, call me. I'll, I'll be there. If, if, if you're in trouble, call me. It's, uh, uh, but, but I try to kind of have as clean a break from work as possible because then I would, I, I want to avoid being called into other things. Um, and, and so just, I, I think taking that firm stand up front, um, you know, um, uh, I, I find that uh, my colleagues and, and students respect that. And so often, uh, you know, they, they make plans to accommodate the fact that I won't be there on Sabbath and, and, and they, you know, or if, they're thinking about doing something, then they would say, well, you know, Alan can't be here on, on Saturday, so let's do it this other day. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, and, and often I think about uh, the song Dare to be a Daniel. Um, and, and I think it, if we do stand on our, on our, on our principles, that, then uh, people respect it. And uh, um, yeah, so 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 I'll I'll leave it with that. Yeah, so so that would be one one instance where where there's a conflict. Well, I'm glad that you said that because um, <clears throat> I think so many times, um, sometimes especially when we first come into a career, we're so eager to start working, and it's almost like it's very easy to want to agree to everything or anything because you want to work you know but that is something that is very important to early on you know when you are on the interview or whatever um they're asking you what times you're available you need to let them know uh, up front um you know when you're available and when you're not available um so that they have no you know, there's no conflict that will come up because you've already established where you stand with that company or organization. I think that's very important. Um, I would like to now ask um, Elder Larie um, about if she's ever encountered any conflict. Uh, that would be yes, or in several occasions. But one that comes to mind in particular is I was a, an entry level supervisor at the time and we were doing layoffs at the company that I worked for. And there was a particular individual that was targeted for layoff who was labeled as a, a gun enthusiast and a bit unstable. And it was well known that he had a huge collection of guns and that he was a very fiery, um, no pun intended, but just in, in, in terms of just his personality, he would go off very quickly. And so they were taking extra precautions. They had uh, police officers on standby outside the day, the, the plan was the day that I was to uh, tell him that he was terminated. 
uh, police officers on standby outside, security guards inside, outside the door where I was going to be giving the, um, the instructions that he was laid off. And so my instructions were that n under no circumstances could I let him know that he was laid off prior to this time because we had this elaborate plan in place. Well, the night before um, the morning where I was to give him the um, notice that he was laid off, he came to my office and he asked me, he said, hey, I know there are a lot of layoffs. Oh. Am I one of them? And so immediately conflict, right? So I hear what my superiors have said, but I know what, what God has said, you know, that, you know, that's not that lie. And so I made the decision. I, I said, let's go in the conference room and talk. And, it's, and, and I just let him know, you know, I'm going to tell you this and, and I need you to think about it. And I need you to understand and listen to the words that I'm saying. So long story short, I told him, and he was very grateful. He said that I allowed him to keep his dignity and he cleared out his stuff that night. He came in the next morning. Uh, there were no conflicts or anything. And um, he um, sometime after that sent me a letter thanking me. And so long story short, I disagree what was, with what was said. You know, we have to make a decision ahead of time, not in the moment, but ahead of time that we are gonna stand on God's promises. We are going to do what God has asked us to do. Yeah. And so in that instance, uh, that was the um, result. Amen. Um, Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Sister Larie. Um, Elder Benson, have you ever come face to face with conflict in your career? Um, uh, thank you. I think uh, I've been lucky in this regard. So, you know, um, I would say overall, I haven't had much issues with conflicts. Um, in general, you know, classes are not scheduled um, in, my, in my area of work. Classes are scheduled only Mondays to Fridays. So that has been a good um, thing for me. Um, occasionally, and when we have exams, maybe on a Monday, we, and this is, voluntary really on our part we do organize to have review classes for students over the weekend um what we do my course is a team taught course so um we have four or five of us teaching the same course what we will do is to divide ourselves into two days some say oh i will come and help the students on on, on saturday i was saying i'm going to church on saturday i can only come and help them on sunday so that way um we resolve that so overall i haven't really had any any major issues to deal with in terms of um, conflict with with my with Sabbath um, in my in my line, and I think I'm happy about that. I I, I pity people who have to struggle um, with that, and they have no choice, as you said earlier on. It could be just the circumstances to make one a little you know desperate in one, at a point in time. But uh, I've been lucky in this regard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Benson, for sharing that. Um, I have a question. Do you ever feel that your career at any point it um, comes in the way with, of your relationship, like that it distracts you from God? Does anybody ever feel that way, that their career distracts them from having a closer relationship with God? Anyone at all? Anyone is able, okay, no one? Okay, good, praise the Lord. Um, also, what physical or emotional needs do you get to minister to in your career? And how are you able to sympathize with people that you encounter? Um, let's start with Elder Oren. Okay, hey, start with the easiest one first, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so working in the healthcare, um, uh, industry, um, you know, so you're ministering to their, uh, mostly to their physical need, um, uh, primarily. Uh, there are other disciplines that 
minister to their um, emotional or mental um, need. But um, for me, I'm ministering mostly to their physical need. Um, you know, the need to uh, maintain or preserve life. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, and then, so how do I transition from, you know, just uh, ministering to the physical, from just the physical to, to the spiritual? Um, and, you know, like I said, it's, it's always just based on where they are. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of like throw out like, uh, you know, God bless you and um, pray that you have a blessed day, those kind of words. And then we'll see where the, what the response is. And then if the response is, um, yes, you too, or you, you are, and then, you know, you, you're a believer, then we have a, a springboard to, right. to, um, to start uh, and to explore and to, you know, um, and to inspire them spiritually and to, you know, um, so uh, in, in the past, you know, um, there was a, a patient here that I even in, in, invite to church and I, he gave his testimony um, about how, you know, God really helped him. You know, he was really down. The doctors were saying that he was about to die. And, you know, we prayed with him um, and uh, invited him to give his, te well, we prayed with him and then God really delivered him. Um, he ended up getting a transplant um, and, you know, he's, uh, he, he has done better since then. Um, and, you know, he came here and he gave his testimony um, and it was such a blessing. So, you know, when we're dealing with ministering to their physical health, it's, um, it, 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 you know, it, it lends, it, it, it naturally lends itself to, um, you know, incorporate God and, um, and, and helping people to see where true healing comes from. Are you um, able to, what um, emotional or physical needs that you minister to in your career and how are you able to sympathize? With well, I, I mean, I, um, I really seek to touch their moral, their moral balance in life because um, so many of these lives are drug infested, um, violence infested, just horrible, horrible situation that they find themselves in. And it's through a cascading, whether the parents aren't around, whether the parents didn't know what they were doing, whether the parents abused them, whether they living on their own. I mean, there's so many moral choices that they've made that were bad for them. And um, I mean, victims alike. And I just feel like to give them the sight of another way of life is uh, my benefit. To give them, to let them know that there's another, another choice they could make, that they don't have to follow this script for them because so many of their brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers are in jail or dead mm -hmm. as a result of their decisions. So I, I, I really get to, you know, it, it's really compelling to me to see that they've changed their life around. They've either gone back to school, they've joined a church, they're taking better care of their children. And all these things are just so beneficial to me personally, when I see that, that I've just mentioned these possibilities, mm -hmm. that you, there's another way. You don't have to do what your mother did or your father did or your brother did or your sister did. You could walk a different path. You just walk it, just try it. And so I, I get that benefit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Elder Benson, um, what physical or emotional needs do you get to minister to you in your career? And how are you able to sympathize with those that you encounter? Yeah, that's a very, um, very good question. Um, here in the vet school where I teach, Mental awareness is a big issue. And that was there even before the pandemic, simply because the curriculum is so tight. We keep students in class from um, eight o'clock to five every day, Monday to Friday, upon all the quizzes and examinations they have to contend with. So 
we had um, a long standing approach to uh, maintaining mental awareness. And because we do not, the university is not able to um, provide counselors, you know, in large numbers, the uh, our college, what they have done is to uh, invite faculty who would love to receive some kind of training in terms of counseling students to be involved in special programs where if students have issues that are not too big, you know what I mean, big, that you don't have to really say a clinical psychologist, they can come to talk to us. And um, now the limitation is the university has so many regulations where you can discuss, you know, um, cannot be too, how do I say that? that you cannot uh, bring issues of religion, you know what I mean, to students, but um, when we have been able to, you know, bring some, some um, comfort to students who are either struggling to get adjusted quickly or are struggling with their classwork is to engage them in a way that I believe using my Christian uh, virtues, like, oh, I understand this is so difficult for everybody. I know uh, this is the first time you are doing this, being in class every day of the week. The exams are too many, the quizzes are varying. So, uh, but you will get through this, you know. Uh, and so, find a way to be compassionate. And, and uh, truly, this is difficult. It's not that we're playing to the gallery. No, this is very tough for young people to deal with. So, uh, we just engage them like that and we organize um, um, talks, sometimes uh, even uh, um, outside the activities on weekends to just let them relax and know that we are working together. Uh, we're not against the students. We are, we are here to do your, your, your work, but we have to do what we have to do. Um, so that, that has been my approach, uh, truly. And um, once in a while, as what Aurin said, I have always thrown in statements like, oh, I need to go to church this evening. Oh, oh, my pastor said something like this yesterday. Oh, my elder said something which I thought was very important, just as a way of showing them my, my Christian background, and, and that's the way I've managed, um, you know, trying to uh, um, inspire them without being overtly religious. Thank you so much for sharing that, Elder Benson. Um, Elder Allen, I actually have a different question for you. Um, because you are a chemical engineer, um, do you ever find object lessons, you know, like, object lessons, spiritual lessons in the work that you do? And does it, um, does it influence your, your walk with God? That, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, and, and I think the, you know, uh, the, the simple answer would be yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, being, so, so uh, one of the, uh, so, so I, I teach a class, uh, a junior level chemical engineering class uh, on heat and mass transport. So, so it's about things moving around, you know, thermal energy, uh, you know, moving from hot to cold or, or you know, uh, a, a, you drop a, 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 uh, you know, a drop of dye in, in water and, and the fact that it, you know, spreads out, right? So, so we're, we're talking about studying those concepts. And, and the simplest equation that we have is, that the flux, the rate at which things move, is equal to the driving force divided by resistance. All right, so so that that's a very simple equation, um, and you know it, it's an equation that that I've been able to use to connect to a lot of biblical concepts. Um, you know, the, so flux is equal to driving force divided by resistance. The higher the driving force, the greater the flux. The lower the resistance, the greater the flux. Right, so. Um, and in talking about our Christian walk, you know, I, I, again, you know, talking about um, illustrations that I've used in, in uh, Sabbath school lessons and, you know, talking about, you know, what, what is our driving force? You know, what, what is really pushing us uh, forward? And, and, and I, I convert that equation um, into, you know, uh, that flux is equal to driving force divided by resistance into, um, you know, the flux is what we achieve in life. And that's going to be equal to why, you know, the question of why are we doing what we're doing divided by how we go about doing what we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, so when it comes to that, how we go about our lives, 
you know, there are many things that in, in life that are um, that resist us, right? It, it's a nature of life in this world. It's a sinful world, and there are things that we need to overcome uh, because of you know when we were born, how we were born. You know, there, there are circumstances in life. There are some uh, resistances that come with that. There's resistance that comes with us wanting to achieve what we want to achieve, um, you know, but, but sometimes resistance are, is good. You know, you cannot fly if there's no resistance. You cannot run if there's no resistance. You cannot swim if there's no resistance. So, so some level of resistance is good because that allows, enables you to uh, do things. But then, you know, th there's also resistances that we introduce to, into our life by choice. Um, and, and so this is an illustration that I've used uh, with especially college age kids. Um, one of the biggest uh, hazards for, for college age kids is, um, you know, drug abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even taking something as simple as, as alcohol. Um, and I explained that, you know, what, what, sometimes by, by choosing to engage in activities, what you are doing is you're adding resistances into your life. And that does nothing but decrease your abil ability to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, so, so, so that, that would be, yeah, there, there are many other examples I could go into, but, but that would be one kind of broad example that where I'm able to utilize uh, my, you know, kind of a fundamental equation that's used in my discipline to explain principles of the gospel and, and principles of uh, kind of just uh, wise living. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so now my question is, um, for young people, um, young Christian people who are in the phase of their life where they are searching for a career um, and trying to find out what they would like to do, um, you know, as far as their career goals, what would be your advice to them? Um, what what are the biggest things that you have learned yourself that you would advise young people in our church today? I would like to start with Elder Larie. Okay, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think just generally, decision-making is something that we, not only as young people, but uh, we struggle with how to make good decisions. And so I think one of the things that I would share is a, a, um, a formula that I learned early in my career to kind of use as a guideline in making good decisions. And the first thing is always pray. I mean, pray throughout, pray throughout the process, but it's twofold. It's pray and work, work and pray, <laughs> pray and work. And one of the acronyms that I'll share with you is called RAP. And it is a decision-making sort of model uh, by the Heath brothers. And they've done a lot of work on decision-making and it's W-R-A-P. The W stands for widen your options. We typically just have either or options. And so we say, I will do this or that. And so we have a very narrow scope of our options. And research shows that when you have a narrow scope of options, like an or, either this or that, that 52% of those decisions fail. And when you increase the amount of options modestly, now you can get to a point where you have too many options and you don't make a decision. But when you modestly increase the options, then the failure rate decreases. And so, um, so, so RAP is widen your options and there's various techniques you can use to do that. Um, the, the R stands for uh, reality check your assumptions. And reality check your assumptions is really about uh, understanding that we have biases. And one of those biases is the confirmation biases, where we look for things in the environment. We look and gravitate to people that uh, will agree with whatever decision we made. And so we want to guard against those types of things and actually look to people that maybe have been through what we've we are looking to go through or in a career that we're wanting to be in, and maybe they left that career. We wanna hear from them and hear some of the things that oppose maybe what our viewpoint is. And there again are some techniques that we can use for that. The A also stands for attain distance before deciding. 
And what that means is um, a lot of times we make very emotional decisions. We are right in the middle of that decision. And one, one uh, technique that I've used often as I've worked in my career and in corporate America, people would come to me and say, hey, I need a decision on this right now, like right this minute. And my answer, my, my, my uh, direct report is no. If you're going to ask me right now to make a decision, my answer is no. Because when you make an emotional decision, often you're making a decision that you may regret in the future. And so it says, uh, the A stands for attain some distance before deciding. Think about what's gonna happen 10 minutes from now. Think about what's gonna happen 10 years from now and what those consequences and outcomes will look like as you're preparing to make that decision. And then finally, the P stands for prepare to be wrong. And what that means is often in the project world, we'll do a after project review. And so that means we sit down and we look at everything that went right with the project and everything that went wrong and could have been done better with the project. Well, one of the techniques for preparing to be wrong is do that ahead of time. So if I decide to go into this career and it's the wrong thing, what, is, what are the worst things that can happen? And then how can I mitigate those things from happening? Can I mitigate those things from happening? And so following a process like that for all your decision making, not just whether what career you're going to go into, but uh, whatever decisions may come up in life can be very useful. And again, it's W-R-A-P, and that stands for RAP. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sister Larie. Um, just for the sake of time, um, I am going. we're going to begin to wrap up. Um, but I would like to also say that just as a young person, well, for one, as we can see, um, with all these various um, career choices, there's always opportunity to serve God, uh, whether we are working for a secular organization or if we work for our own organizations, there's always opportunities. And um, we see that some careers bring us to people who are at their lowest and worst state, you know, in life and God needs people there. But also some careers, um, you know, like being a university professor bring us to people who are, you know, they're just starting off in life and we are able to minister to people there as well. We're able to minister to people in every, um, every part of their, of their lives. Um, we are going to um, now have a special music um, by Sister Nadisha Parks. Is she on? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, happy Sabbath. Happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. In the field, no right point, there's a work for all to do. Heart the master's voice is calling to the harvest calling you does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known it is great if god is in it and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you go in Jesus' name, when the conflict here is ended and a race on earth is run, he will 
stay if we are faithful welcome home my child will die if the mad rush up the broad way in the reanthus drive tell of jesus love and mercy give to them the word of life little as much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and we can win it if we go in jesus name oh there's a crown and we can win it if we go in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And now we will have a short clip um, about the Waldensian. Found someone that they thought was maybe interested in the gospel. They would take the Bible out of the stitches of their coat and share the truths of God's word with them. You know, maybe you're working today in a doctor's office. Maybe you're working as a nurse in a hospital. Maybe you're a teacher in a school, or maybe you're a lawyer in some law firm. You are not there simply to collect a paycheck to pay the bills. You are there as a missionary. God has put you there for a specific purpose there may be someone in your workplace that God knows only you can reach. As students as well, the first reason why they went to study was not to get the best degree, but it was to be a missionary in the great universities in Europe. You today may be a missionary in a great institution. You are not there just for academic excellence. You are there also to seek and find people that you can share the gospel with. And the other thing we learned from the Waldensians is how important the Bible was to them. If they would take just a few pages and put it in their coats and then share it with other people, how much more should we commit the Bible to memory? How much more should we commit the Bible to study that we would know God's word and be able to share it wherever we are? They stand today, these Waldensians, as an inspiration to us and may it inspire us for service may it inspire us for study wherever we are. Amen. 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 Um, let us go ahead and close with prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this wonderful program that we were able to have. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless the young people, Lord. You have called them to serve you. And you have called them to do your work, oh Lord, and help us to come to the understanding that no matter where we are, Lord, no matter what setting we are in, um, that we are able to be used by you as instruments of your righteousness, Lord, and we are able to bring people to Jesus. And Father, I just ask that you would, because you have created each and every single one of us, um, Lord, I ask that you would place your anointing on each and every single young person, Father, and I ask that you would help us to know what your purpose is for us, Lord, that we can serve you and that your name will be glorified on high. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Kevin. And that's it. And that's it. That is, <laughs> have a wonderful evening. And thank you, everyone who joined online. Thank you to our panelists. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a wonderful Bye. Sabbath. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.